also don't read me any bad comments. <laughs> We're live. We just too. went live. No bad comments, no. everyone. Guys, I'm very. It's in fragile. Jamie's contract. Yeah, I, it's, <laughs> my 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 writer just says no one be mean to me. That's my yeah. only demand. <laughs> I'm soft. No wonder you were woke. I know. I know. You need a I know. safe space. How you? <laughs> I do. I do, dude. I never knew how when we didn't like each other. I wish I knew you were funny because <laughs> what a bummer when we met and I was like, oh, we should have been friends for a very long time. Yeah, it's well. I mean, it's funny because I was looking. Okay, first of all, hi everyone. Hello. We're live. This is Jamie Kilstein. Um, he he's very tired. He's jet lagged. He was just in Hawaii working and we're going to be very supportive of him tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also know the things we're going to talk about. And I just want, like, I remember back in the day, back when I was like pretty successful, whenever I'd go on a show, the intro was like, oh, this next guy is very funny. You've seen him on Conan. You've heard him on Joe Rogan. And now my intros are like, hey guys, we got to like <laughs> be really gentle. He should be dead. Uh, I have no idea how he has persevered. Uh, please welcome the very unstable Jamie Kilstein. And I'm just like, <laughs> hello, everybody. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Uh, I Can you I, like, okay, so you were just in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And you said just before we went live. Yeah. That you were trying to, to find your roots and dealing oh, yeah. with some midlife crisis thing. Yeah. And I like, are you Hawaiian? Yeah, I'm Hawaiian, but I look okay. like the people who like colonized and like overthrew the queen. Yeah, so, I was about to make a joke like, oh, ha ha ha, because you're Hawaiian, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> no, I am. And like all my other siblings, by the way, have these like beautiful Hawaiian middle names. I was the, I was the firstborn. I'm one of five. And um, so their middle names are like Malia, Kalani, Kiyoki, uh, Kiola, and mine's Alexander, who again, sounds like the soldier who literally overthrew the queen and like dragged her out of the palace. And so now there's so much about Hawaiian culture that like a lot of people, including myself, don't know. And there's also so much like beauty in it. And it makes sense. Like Hawaiians are like fighters and musicians and storytellers. Um, but because I look so white when I'm over there with my Hawaiian friends, the more Hawaiian I try to be, I almost feel more racist. Like I know I'm Hawaiian, but whenever I'm like, Aloha, how's it bra? I just feel like someone's like, please don't appropriate our culture. And then I'm like, it's my culture too. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's what I was doing. And midlife crisis, I'm just fucking 40 and divorced and figuring out who the fuck I am. Oh, no, you're when you out. were like super woke and progressive, yeah. am I? Okay, you know what? I just realized that I didn't um, hardwire myself in, um, and I can do that if you want to. Sure. Do you want me to you can do take me to... over for just a minute? I'm gonna... Yeah, I'll I'll vamp. Just I'm just gonna uh, like riff just... on something because I just I noticed that too, and I was like, oh crap, yeah. I'm on the Wi-Fi. Hey guys, when she tells a comedian... okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop my cam. Okay, I'll be right back. I got this. <laughs> I was going to start prepared over here. I'm going to start screaming about progressive issues. Guys, what she wants to talk about is free Palestine. Uh, no, I'm going to do what every comedian does. Uh, I'm going to promote my shit. I'm going to talk uh, a lot. I have a mental health podcast. It's a mental health comedy podcast because I'm a mess, but it's called Advice Not Taken. So I'm not coming from a pretentious place. We're just all trying to get through it together. Um, and then you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Jamie Kilstein. And you can follow me on Instagram where I'm a shadow band um at the jamie kilstein you guys support people who are shadow banned um at the jamie kilstein and i talk about mental health and i post little comedy things okay that's my promotion so i'm pretty sure hello i'm back okay wait if, I, if you if you get kicked out of the stream i'll be right back oh she froze again do i vamp do i plug my instagram again at the Jamie, J A M I E. Okay, Hello. I think I'm back. Kilstein. Now we just have to wait for Jamie to come back. Ooh, I, I think I'm back. Sorry about that. I really thought I'd done everything. While you we're here, if everyone could please uh, like and subscribe, I would really appreciate that. This is something I always forget to do, but I know I'm supposed to do. Um, do you have and me back? And we're live. With Jamie Kilstein. I am here. And everybody see me and hear me, okay? 
I'm gonna. Should I even try to return? Should I? Here. Oh, okay. Hello. Anything? He might have to leave and come back. Also. Yeah, he's left. Okay, how is everyone doing tonight? <laughs> that was my fault, to be fair. I had to restart everything. Um, okay, I'm good now. Okay, super. Oh, Jamie's back. Okay, we're back. Sorry yeah. about that. That's right. I, was I screwed there. everything up. But I was there the whole time, and it was a fucking nightmare. Um, oh, okay. Hello. I'm back. Anyway. I okay. I want so when you were like woke and yeah. super progressive, did you use your Hawaiian roots and heritage to like bully people into silence no. or to like have no. like <laughs> credibility? No. no, no. I I, uh, I you know when I th the easy route on this show is just to be like fucking libtards and just start like naming all of my old shitty friends and like what they did off the record um but to be oh, honest goodness. it's like even though i feel like i am more conservative and at, at the at the at the least i'm more in the center i still like i, I remember joe's been really rogan's been really supportive of me in the last couple of years like every time i come up he's very nice um but the one thing he will say like occasionally is be like yeah he was just like you know saying he was a feminist to get pussy and i was like joe <laughs> i wish i wish i wish <laughs> like, that would have been so much easier um i mean even when i think i even said this on my old podcast when people were using the term male uh, male feminist even before i got canceled I was creeped out by that. I didn't give myself that fucking name. I hear male feminist and I think about a dude just like driving around like Sarah Lawrence in a van, like playing Tegan and Sarah or some shit, trying to like lure feminists in. And I just said things that like I really believed. I was a douchebag about them, which I would like to think I'm less of now. But like I really believed certain things. And the things I've gone back on, I haven't gone back because suddenly I'm like, uh oh that side doesn't like me. So I better switch teams. I've just right. met so many conservative people who have been so kind to me and I see the way they treat their friends and their families. And that makes me go, well, if I respect you as a man or I respect you as a woman, maybe I should start asking you questions about these political beliefs that I thought I would never see eye to eye on starting from that baseline of, I respect you. And that has made me legitimately change my mind on issues. I mean, if I was going to just switch sides to switch sides, I should have done it eight years ago when I got canceled, when I had no money, when I was suicidal, when my cat was covered in fleas in Los Angeles. And I literally got like a book deal offer to essentially do like a, a right wing thing. And I was yeah. just like, that's not who I, I would just, I would have become the right wing version of the douchebag I was on the left. And now not profitable, but trying to figure out who I am, where I stand, trying to be on both sides when that makes sense. Um, but like, yeah, like when I used, dude, there were so many things that I never talked about publicly that I saw on the left that I just cringed about, including if I saw someone who looked like me been like the Hawaiian kingdom was overthrown. Like I care about Hawaiian issues, but to use that to like prove a point again, like, I'm sure maybe I did douchey stuff like that, but I was too, I was too on my like white male privilege um, kick to talk about being oppressed. It's very insulting. I mean, it's essentially like it's accusing you of being a grifter, which unfortunately is what a lot of, cause people have said that about me a lot that they're like, Oh, she moved to the right, which I haven't moved to the right. I've just moved away from the left. But I don't yeah. think I really actually have any particularly right wing views unless people have decided that like, you know, rational policy that actually makes sense and helps people is right wing or like free speech belongs to the right, which some right. people have. Which, by but the way, the left like that's that's why so many people are leaving the left it's like free speech was one of my really big issues back in the day and it's like oh okay well if you're abandoning a lot of your principles i mean the fact that the rights like the only one talking about like this like massive environmental disaster in ohio and the left just like look at them playing politics i'm like guys can't you <laughs> see what fucking hypocrites 
we're being like, I always say this where it's like, you should have principles and not parties. Like I got in trouble because I criticized Obama. I liked Obama as like a person, but when I went on Conan, I did a whole rant about him drone striking brown people. Cause that's what I said under fucking George Bush. Like I've always sort of been getting shit from both sides. Um, and the grifter thing to me, it's such a disingenuous way to shut someone down. Um, it's yeah. just this like talking point. Like one of the reasons I was so afraid to start going on right wing shows is because I knew that word would come out. And again, if I was going to grift guys, it would have made so much sense to grift eight years ago, six years ago, four years ago. This is just like, I'm actually in a really healthy, good place. You know, like I still deal with like depression and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm in a good place and I have really good people around me. And a lot of those people are more conservative. And so I go, you know, to me getting on these big platforms that may be more conservative than me, right. Going on Glenn Beck show and talking about, Hey, here's what's wrong with the left. But like, also, do you think you guys do this thing that's kind of fucked up and Glenn goes, yeah, we do. And then we just kind of talk about how we can both be better as people like that to me is so much more, uh, I don't want to use the word healing, but kind of than just when me and him used to scream at each other or when me and you screamed at each other, like me and you probably still disagree on a lot of stuff, but this is the way to actually find common ground. And then people will see that. And they're like, well, if those two sides are getting together, then we'll just call them grifters to shut that down because we profit off of divisiveness, whether on the left or on the right. Well, and I think that a lot of people who are stuck ideologically, um, you know, people who are still really, really attached to feminism is always the right answer. And anyone who criticizes feminism is bad and right wing or misogynist, hates women, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it, people who are still really, really attached to the left to the point where they won't consider views that are labeled right wing, regardless of whether or not those views make sense. I mean, I think that they, they are, they would call you a grifter or I a grifter and they would hope and they would tell themselves and tell their friends that we changed our views or we, you know, left the left or whatever, because there was profit in it, not because there was any good reason to reconsider those ideologies and politics and views and behavior, because right. there are lots and lots of really good and important reasons why we should reconsider and be critical, because I think that the left has become super irrational and toxic and, you yeah. know, pretty authoritarian in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, I would be much richer if I wasn't doing this, you yeah. know what I mean? Whether I was all the way on the left or all the way on the right. Um, when I go on these right wing shows, I get a lot of fan mail, but the fan mail isn't like, Oh, you came to our side. The fan mail is like, dude, thank you for trying to like bring people together. But I also get a fuckload of hate. You know, I can only go so far. That's the thing too. Unless I was like full conservative, like I can go on Glenn's show all the time and he has me on all the time and that's great. But like, could I have my own show on that network? I don't know. You know, um, if I wrote a book, um, I've made this joke on podcast before. I think I said this on Tim Pool's show. Like if I wrote a book called like, yeah, well, why the right is right and why I left the left or like from right. freedom fighter to, from feminist to freedom fighter. And it was like me and Andrew Tate, like that's a way to make money. But when you try to write a book about, I know people who have tried when you try to write like a pitch, a book about like nuance and like happiness and everyone's just like, yuck. Um, and so it's really, it, it, it's hard. And to be honest, like, Dude, I would go on more left wing shows if I could. And I would say the exact same things that I say on right wing shows. I just don't get invited. Yeah. Um, I get invited on comedy shows, but even liberal comedians I know are being considered right because somehow laughter got deemed right wing. Um, somehow now it's only Ben Shapiro tweeting about Dave Chappelle specials, where when I grew up, Dave Chappelle was a hero of the left. I was watching him perform in clubs, talking about the Iraq war post 9-11 in New York in front of 50 people doing material that would make you cry. Like the stuff he did about race was so empowering to the black communities. 
And now the left fucking hates him. And whenever a comedian gets criticized, I see these big liberal accounts be like, comedy is evil. It's like laughter is, what are you fucking talking about, guys? Comedy is dangerous. It's dangerous, right? Well, it's always we been dangerous. We have to be serious it's, it's, all the time. I know. It's supposed to be dangerous, guys. Like, right. Yeah, Richard, I guess it is dangerous well, like, <laughs> in Richard, some ways. Richard I mean, Pro satire is, is a, a really powerful way to criticize politicians and, and those in power, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what it's supposed to be. So, you know, I, there was a, a pretty, I mean, a very famous like left wing comic who I recorded his podcast and he was like, dude, that was one of the best episodes I've done. And I was so happy. This was like a year or two ago. So it was like way past. And for anyone new, uh, we're not gonna, there's not a big reveal that I was accused of rape. Um, I had an affair, I had an affair. Um, Somebody in the comments, yeah, actually did ask. She was like, oh, I'm not familiar with this guy's background. So I was gonna ask you to sort of relay your yeah, yeah, cancellation the, story, yeah. which I'm sure you're sick of. I'm telling. so sick of it. Yo, the yeah. guys, just to be clear, I was canceled for murder. Um, I was canceled, yeah. He doesn't had, murder anymore. I don't know. No, no, I'm a reform. That's the name of the book, actually. It's refer reformed murderer. People are like, <laughs> all the murderers are like, you fucking grifter, not murdering anymore, pussy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I had an affair, but because I was, um, because I was, and look, when I have told the story before, like on Rogan's, on every podcast in the world, there's been like plenty of remorse and. I took so much blame that even Joe was like, Hey man, you're taking probably too much blame. Um, but, uh, and now I'm just jet lag and it's like eight years later and I still have to, not your fault. I still have to, I have to talk about it all the time. I went on a fucking first date and I had to talk about it. I've had to talk about it to girlfriend's parents. I have to talk about it when I'm going to partner with someone new. I have to talk about it all the fucking time. And every time I sit someone down and I'm like, oh, there's something you got to know. And they look terrified. And then I tell them and then they go, Oh yeah. Oh, I think I heard about that. So anyway, it was because I was this self-righteous asshole on the left and a male feminist, quote unquote. And uh, so it became a very funny story. It was more about the hypocrisy of it. And also at that point, I just didn't have any friends. Like I had, I burned my bridges with the comedy friends um, like Joe and those guys because of the feminism stuff. And then every one of my friends on the left once I couldn't get them on MSNBC and they kind of got their marching orders were like, all right, we're not allowed to be friends with you anymore. So I lost like everyone right away. And mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was famous or funny enough, like Louis or someone like that. I couldn't just like keep going. Like I, I lost everything, like all my money, all of my, like in a day. And, um, you know, there's stuff that my friends know and that a lot of, people know that would make me look better. And I just kind of shrug and go, the bottom line is I shouldn't have had an affair. The bottom line is no matter how much a marriage is suffering, you can always get a divorce. Um, and I thought I was smarter than that. And I was stupid and I was, I was young and, uh, you know, in love and confused and, codependent and all these things. Um, so I did that, but because it was only sort of covered by my former friends, like super lefties, um, the affair was called sexual misconduct. Um, the, there was in, in the Jezebel article, this one, I always say just cause it shows how crazy it is. So essentially the girl I had the affair with put out like, um, I remember she said to me once, she goes, if you break up with me, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, write a book about this. And I was like, I'm not famous enough for a book, but I was famous enough for a Facebook post and a, <laughs> and a, a Jezebel article. Um, I'm definitely getting like looser with the tongue about this than I should. So in the Jezebel article, oh, so she put out like a call, like who has been wronged by supposed feminist Jamie Kilstein. And out of the like high five, hundreds of girls I've had sex with, there were like two. And one of them was like, he sent me DMs and I told him I had a boyfriend and he said, I'm sorry. That's like the gist of that. And by the way, I still have DMs from that girl. I literally said, sorry, and stopped talking to her. And then she kept trying to talk to me. And I was like, Bleh. and I, at this point, by the way, which it also doesn't say in the Jezebel article, me and my ex were in, uh, were in an open relationship, which we said publicly on the podcast, trying to sort of like fix this dysfunctional marriage, right? Um, and so that wasn't even like cheating. I wasn't like just sending fucking, you know, whatever. And then uh, the other woman in the Jezebel article 
This is the craziest one. I think it alludes that we slept together. We actually didn't sleep together because she told me, um, she goes, Hey, I don't sleep. I, I was just in town for a night. So this open relationship was like, it was just the most unhealthy sort of open relationship where it's like, don't ask, don't tell. So it's essentially like, just go fuck on the road. And I don't want to hear about it. And I want to pretend it's not happening. Kind of thing. Yeah. And which, hopefully this will save our relationship. It's going to work. Uh, but I was so stupid because I was, you know, I read this book that really helped me out a lot. Have you ever read Esther Perel, the sex therapist? Uh, well, I've listened to her podcast a bunch, Okay, but so I never read her book, but yeah, I'm familiar she, with her. She has a book with a very stupid title called State of Affairs. And, yeah, right, I've heard of it. Yeah. And it really made me feel better because all these dumb fucking things that I thought only an idiot like me would think, you know, like this affair is going to save the marriage. That sounds insane. Um, but <laughs> reading a book, I'm reading like about 40 year old women who are like professional lawyers who have kids who were saying the same dumb shit because they were in a, a failing relationship. Um, and so that was really helpful. But anyway, um, so this girl says, so I'm in this open relationship and so I'm only in town for a night and she goes, Hey, I don't, you know, we've been like talking online and she goes, I don't, um, sleep with people. Uh, on the first date. So I go, if you really are mean that, if no matter what happens tonight, I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to say no. And she goes, okay. So then we hook up and we get naked and like, I shut it down. Like we do not have sex. So I do not have sex with this girl. Uh, get her a car the next day, uh, walk her to the car, all good. And then in the Jezebel article, she said something along the lines of it was the safest I ever felt or the happiest I like something implying that when I'm with a woman, I treat them right. Um, and I'm not a fucking creep. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then she goes, but a week later he called me a road fuck on his podcast. And then Jezebel, I swear to you in an article that is still up when you Google me, um, when girlfriends Google me. It said, uh, Jezebel in parentheses said, Jezebel could not find this quote. The reason Jezebel cannot find this quote is because I was not talking about road pussy on my feminist podcast with my wife. Like that is <laughs> fucking insane. But that was called emotional abuse. So the headline was sexual misconduct, predatory behavior, and emotional abuse, which by the way, if I read that, if I'm about to go on your podcast and I read that about you, I'm going to go, oh, Megan's a creep and I'm not going to go on our podcast. And you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, most. hopefully now because of because I think that a lot of what happened during Me Too was that people stretched. Not always. I mean, in many cases, people were talking about serious rape and sexual assault. But in yeah. many other cases, people were making vague accusations where they would accuse somebody of abuse and then there would have been no abuse. And I guess you're one of the people that happened to that also happened to Stephen, Gall Stephen Galloway. I don't know if you were familiar with that story. He's Canadian, so that okay. didn't make the American news. But it doesn't count. I mean... Essentially, it was, yeah, he was he was accused of abuse, and that was the only thing that was ever in the media. There was never any details. There was never yeah. any evidence. Nobody even knew who the accuser was because she remained anonymous, and it was this big, horrible, drawn-out ordeal. He lost his job at UBC. He was the head of the creative writing department at UBC. He had a oh, mental shit. health breakdown, you know. I mean, anyway, it, it, really it's, bad. It's so, I mean, not that, like, and I, another reason I never really like went on the defense is, I mean, one, I was just like super suicidal, but also I don't want to sound like the victim. I do want to take ownership for my fuck ups and I have grown from them and that's great. Um, but what's interesting is the majority of friends I have and like the communities I'm in. So whether it's like comedy or jujitsu, um, the majority of listeners to my podcast, oddly enough, or like messages I get on Instagram, uh, are from women. And a lot of the women I've dated since then have, you know, <laughs> I remember the first girl, cause my last ex who we had like a really nice breakup. She said this to me in an email afterwards where she was like, you, it was the safest, like you made me feel so safe and I want it to be like, write a post about that on the internet, please. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, it, and, and I think the reason that women have been so supportive of me is kind of what, what you said, which is there are so many horrible things that still happen to women. I've seen dudes who have been like accused of shit, like go total red pill. And I get it. But I think the only reason I'm not dead is because I told myself, like, no matter how bad it gets, I can't get bitter. I'm going to take ownership. I can't be sitting around like, fuck these women, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. All women are like, like, I've tried to have, you know, relationships. I've, you know, I, um, I still believe that like women should have equal rights and women shouldn't have to fear for their fucking safety. And, you know, I advocate for like women to take self-defense and like I've taught women, um, all of that stuff still really matters to me. And I think that the problem with these, like, and I said this on Rogan's when I had the opportunity to grift, if I wanted to grift, when he was sort of like, I think he said, like, is it worse when a guy's falsely accused or is it the same or something like it was so long ago, something like that. And the kind of talking point that I stick with is it is bad if a guy is falsely accused or if like an affair is conflated with a sexual whatever. Um, but it's also really bad for women because women now people take a lot of women's like actual um concerns or accusations less seriously i think we saw it with the aziz anzari one like that was the one that people started just going oh right. is this all just mad women and like yeah. stupid and that's really bad for women because there are like legitimate creeps and legitimate predators and like um and then there's just shitty relationships that people fuck up yeah, and I mean the worst the worst response that you could have for yourself would have been to get real bitter and hateful. I mean, um, I would have I would have had a lot of money. I would have been on Andrew Tate's plane, dude. That yeah, for dope. sure. You I would mean, have gotten would, a I, lot of support from some circles. And yeah, I mean the the reality still is that it's not very common for women to actually fake rape, rape accusations or domestic right. abuse accusations, right. but the other reality is that you know, if, and I understand that going to the cops over this shit is like a horrible experience, but if you're going to accuse somebody of a crime, then you should go through the court system and you should call the cops. You shouldn't just make a Facebook post with vague accusations and then let shit right. fly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, I, I don't mean, think that really, I mean, it resolves something in terms of the men getting socially punished. Um, but I don't know that. It, I mean, if someone's a fucking rapist or domestic abuser, they should be in jail. Well, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't protect other women. If this guy is genuinely a predator, right. Then I don't think that it's going to have the result yeah. of ensuring that he doesn't do it again. Uh, in fact, guys, if you cancel him and he loses his job, he's just going to have more time to be a predator. He's going <laughs> to learn new tactics. He's going to be able to buy weapons. Uh, you don't want that at all. He has more yeah, time to maybe prowl. to become a better predator. <laughs> <laughs> he could go into training. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not good. We don't want that. <laughs> no, no one wants that. I wanted to ask you because like, so you got this label male feminist and sure. because I was such a big feminist better than all the other feminists, mm -hmm. as you'll, as you'll recall. Yeah. Um, I mean, even <laughs> then I was like, ew, male feminist. Like I hated, I was like men, I was like, men can't be feminists and any man who this calls was, himself a male feminist, yeah. I'm going to think is gross, which is probably true. Although I don't agree with Joe that it's all about trying to get laid because I don't think that. I don't think that there's a lot of women who actually would sleep with the guy just because he claims to. No, be I grossed you out. That's the evidence <laughs> right there. You were right. like, yuck. I still was attracted to alpha males despite my politics. Oh, dude, I have so many of my fucking feminist friends who will like whisper to me and they're just like, hey, also, though, can guys stop being such fucking pussies? Like, it's so gross and unattractive. Yeah. 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 I, I'm definitely, I like the crew I hang out with now a lot more anyway you were going to uh, like but a i mean so i i think it was interesting i mean there's a bunch of things that were interesting but you said that you you didn't even like that label and you felt yeah. uncomfortable with that label yes yeah why i mean uh, i think the your you, what you just said is right it's not the most like academic answer but like something inside you just goes Ew. Like, what, what is that? Well who goes um, around advertising that like well, I feel it, it, it also it's like it's taking I mean, I, again, it's an, I, I feel like even the progressive version of me would have said something like it's taking away attention from women, like it's making it about a dude, which it also shouldn't be like what I always said is some form of like, man, I just think women should be treated equally. 
Like that was it, you know, and I had some feminist bits I had, you know, before it was like a huge, silly conversation. Like, I think I had one of the first bits about like if men got like cat called and like silly bits like that. And like I would try to make them like edgy and filthy and funny. Um, And I remember I think it was like, is that site Upworthy still a thing? I don't think it, I mean, okay. I haven't seen I don't it or heard of it in ages, either. so I think it may have disappeared. Um, but, but they like learn. posted a couple like YouTube rants that I did about feminism. Um, I mean, fuck. I remember they called me a male feminist and it was like this stupid old headshot with me like crossing my arms and I felt so uncomfortable. But I think I actually may have ended up eventually after that label was given to me because I, I, I want to be like honest. I just have don't remember a lot of this stuff. I probably did do some kind of rant finally, just cause I was called it about being a male feminist. But even then I think the premise was probably something like him. Hey, it's just fucking common sense. It's just like, don't be a, an asshole to women. And then people were like, he's being an asshole to women. And I was well, like, and you know, and like what I was noticing about the male feminists is that they were all such bitter actually i don't like throwing around the word misogynist that much anymore but they all seem like these bitter misogynists like kind of hateful assholes and like i mean it's interesting because you were called a male feminist and now i'm sure you would not describe yourself in that way and no one else would describe you in that way but i think you're probably like a much better man and a more responsible accountable man than you were then that's a really cool thing that you said that I've never talked about on a podcast and I'm not good about make talking highly of myself, but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the people I hang out with and to your point. So when I got to Texas, um, I love the comedy community, but the comedy, you know, comics are fucking degenerates. Um, but I've also started hanging out with, do you know who Tim Kennedy is? I don't okay. know. So Tim Kennedy, he's been on Rogan a bunch, has like millions of followers on Instagram. You look at his Instagram and you go, this guy's fucking super conservative, but special forces guy, UFC, uh, black belt. I mean, just one of the most, literally one of the baddest men on the planet. He had a TV show called like, it was something like try to kill Tim Kennedy. And like, <laughs> it was just him doing like insane shit. And so I hang out with him and a bunch of his guys and I train at that gym and I'm around those guys every day. And these are dudes I see them interact with their wives. I see them teach. I see them teach kids. I see them with their kids that if I just saw them online, I would just assume they were, you know, super conservative bros. I probably would have called them. And if I'm being super honest to your point, when you were talking about male feminists being like bitter, I think that part of my insecurity, and it would have been worse if like I, I haven't like I've fought for 20 years. I've trained like jujitsu and MMA. And I think that's how I got like a little bit of masculinity. So maybe if I didn't have that, I'd be I'd go down that more hateful route. But I'm also five seven and I've never looked like a fighter besides I have fucked up ears. And so I think that there probably was just like comedians. A lot of us become funny because that's the only way we can get girls. Not that Joe was right that I was like maliciously being like. I'm going to be a male feminist to get girls. But I think that like when I had the chance to shout down bros who were essentially, you know, more successful, better looking, taller, more alpha than me, that if I'm being totally honest, that probably was part of the motivation where I could just go fuck those guys. Right. And again, subconsciously, I don't know what I'm fucking doing. Um, so anyway, so to your original point, so now I'm around all these guys who I admire so much. And I was never in the military. I was a fuck the police guy. And I just, I watch these dudes. And by the way, these dudes will criticize conservatives. They will criticize police. They'll support police, but you know, they were the first ones to come out when Uvalde happened being like, what the fuck are these guys doing? They do not blindly support their side as much as my side used to blindly support my side. And uh, whatever this could, I don't care. I'm talking to you. This could get taken out of context or people could use it, but the amount of dates I've been on in the last couple months, we're doing shit like holding the door or 
planning or switching sides if a shady dude's walking down the road. Just stuff that's really basic that honestly I used to do back in the day. I'd occasionally get shit for it. Um, I've multiple times have had women or just ask them out on a date instead of being like, hey, you want to like hang out sometime? Um, I've had multiple women be like, thanks for being a man. And I've yeah. never gotten that compliment before. And it's for, <laughs> again, this isn't like to be like, I'm such a good dude. It's for the littlest fucking things. But I think that so much of masculinity is being um, demonized, right? Like there is talk. Uh, Tim Kennedy actually said on my podcast, he goes, toxic masculinity is usually just dudes being dicks. They're like assholes. They're shitty to women. They fucking, they're, it's not, it's the opposite of masculinity. It, like masculinity shouldn't even be in that fucking sentence. Um, but true masculinity, like me not being afraid to tell a girlfriend that if we're in a relationship, like I'm going to fucking protect you. That doesn't mean that I don't think you can handle it, but like I want to handle it. I want to provide, I want to do all those things. I think that on top of the fact that, yeah, I haven't had affairs that yes, I speak my mind more. Um, and I was so afraid to do it before that maybe that's why any place else I could get some attention or validation. I would, um, I absolutely feel like being around these guys, which is wild because I used to just assume conservatives were just misogynistic. Yeah. Um, I've become a better man. The people I'm around, the way they treat women, it, it's just, it's fucking incredible. Like I look up to them. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good point that I, I haven't put into words yet. So like, I, I want to explore that a little more, um, but that's all I got right now on that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I've been, I've been trying to figure that one out too, because I, like you used to assume that conservatives or right-wing men we're all just misogynists. And then, you know, I started to realize and learn that, I mean, first of all, I don't think good men go around bragging about what good men they are. Like, I don't think they go around labeling themselves feminists. I think they just act like good men and they have humility. Right. Um, but I mean, you know, like somebody like Rogan, again, is somebody who is always being labeled sort of, you know, I don't always in really unfair ways, but I think that the feminists and the leftists would not think of him as a feminist. And in fact, I think that he is super feminist and yeah. he's very supportive of women and he, you know, totally believes in equal rights. And, you know, a lot of these MMA guys and jujitsu guys um, are also like really, really good guys, like good yeah. guys who are also like strong and tough and dangerous, but have a certain amount of humility, you know, are accountable um, and, you know, are chivalrous. And like, yeah. they, and I think, I think that some of it might have to do, I'm still sorting this through, like you have power, but you don't use it. Like you could kill somebody, but That's you it. have to choose not to, like you can't behave right. like an asshole because you know that you could hurt somebody. Right. That's it. I mean, I'm refusing to quote Jordan Peterson because then I'll definitely be called a grifter. He has a line about this. So instead, I'm going to quote a Buddhist parable, um, which is it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Right. And ever since I've like really doubled down because I feel like for, you know, 10 years when I was kind of in the lefty scene and training, I would just train and go home. But now I'm like immersed and live like more of that lifestyle, like my fighter lifestyle isn't just at the gym, it's at home. I feel more disciplined. The people I listen to, I'm much more likely to listen to Jocko than I am, you know, Democracy Now! or whatever. Um, I get up early, I meditate, I, I don't make excuses for myself. I, I really try not to have that victim mentality, which again, I always thought was a right-wing talking point. And to be fair, a lot of times it is, rich right-wing politicians or even rich left-wing politicians telling, you know, a struggling single mother, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And it's like, well, okay, you stole all the boots, right? Um, and, but me as just a person seeing when I'm jumping into that victim mentality and instead being like, wait, 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 how can we fix this? How can I get better? I don't just want to go on Twitter and say, you know, I'm depressed. I talk about that sometimes because I have a big mental health following. Like that's kind of my podcast. So when I am sad, I do say something, but the point of saying something is that I'm also going to say how I got out of it. 
afterwards. I'm not just going to do what I did before, Mm -hmm. which is be like, I'm sad. And then all my like lefty friends are like, go watch Netflix, eat cake. And I'm like, okay. Uh, And then I'm just like sadder. Right. And you should never be sad eating cake. Um, But I have been plenty of times. Waste of cake. (laughs) Total fucking waste of cake. (laughs) And, um, and so I think that now that I'm immersed and I treat comedy more like a job and I live like a fighter, um, you're right. You know, there, I don't have to prove myself at a party. I don't need to act fake tough. I also don't need to do what I did before, which is cut down guys who I think are tougher than me. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need to get laid to prove to myself that I'm a man. I had, this happened to me twice in the last two weeks, um, uh, <laughs> in front of some comedian friends where, uh, I was getting hit on by drunk girls and I literally, I was like, how about I just get you water and you sit down instead? And they'd be like, okay. And then I would like swap their wine out for water. I did the opposite of Jesus. I like turned like (laughs) wine into water and I was like, I'm going to do this. Not that I ever would have like fucked a drunk girl, but just the idea of like, I would rather keep this girl safe than even think about Um, even like getting her Instagram for when she sobers up tomorrow. Like I feel more of a, a duty to, um, protect people than virtue signal that I am such a good guy. What I've made this joke before, but I feel like back in the day I would, you know, someone would be like, Jamie, your mom needs you. And I'd be like, tell her I, 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 I'm busy. I'm tweeting about feminism. Whereas now it's like, I don't tweet about feminism, but you know, all the girl comedians in Austin know that if they need someone to walk them to their car, on sixth street. Cause it's shady. Like I will do that. Um, mm. I'm teaching some of them jujitsu. Like I'm bringing them into the gym. Like I would rather empower women. Um, yeah. And that's not something I've uh, really talked about. Um, but I, yeah, you are right. Um, it is the, the, the top, the more you build yourself up as a man and not just with fighting with, with all the things, right. With mindfulness, with eating, right. With being disciplined, you know, I don't drink, um, stuff like that the more confidence you have, the more confidence you have, the less you need to be a self-righteous douchebag. I will say though, um, I'm glad I went through all that other stuff because some of the feminine traits I still have, um, being able to talk about my emotions, being a good communicator, um, eating pussy. I do. I guess I do brag about myself. Um, (laughs) like I'm, I'm still glad I can be vulnerable and I have all those things, but I, I have to self-correct a lot. And I have a lot of like, fighter girlfriends who will help me with this where I I was that way for so long that I talk all this big game right now. But if I'm talking to a new girl tomorrow and she really like needs me to come fly out to her or whatever, I, there's still that part of me that wants to like mother and caretake and not be like, no, I have things to do here. Not be more in my masculine, you know? So I, I'm still fighting that, um, kind of like, I, I can drift easier to like more feminine, um, you know, when I, when I start talking to girls. I didn't realize that you had been training for that long. Like I knew that you were into jujitsu, but I didn't actually realize that you fought. Yeah. Well, I mean, dude, I, well, uh, so I've, I've, I've only had, I had a Muay Thai fight and then I've just competed in jujitsu. I wasn't like a fucking oh, cool. UFC fighter, but I've gotten to train with like all the top UFC fighters and, yeah, I forget I'm good until I think about all the things I've done. And then, I mean, they even brought me in in Austin to train with Alexander Volkanovsky, who just fought for oh, like, crazy. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I watched. Um, and, you know, it was just like me and two other dudes. And I'm like, oh, that's right. I'm like good at fighting. I started fighting when it was lawless. So for anyone like my age, like 40, you guys will remember old UFC one. It was illegal. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it was like, it was great. It, I feel like old UFC was like parenting in the nineties. It was just like all sort of fucking reckless. Um, there were no weight classes. There weren't like, there were like two rules. It was like, you couldn't hit in the balls and you couldn't bite or something. Um, you'd fight three times in a night. It was literally the, the Jean-Claude you had to fight movie. three times in a night. Yeah. And it was style versus style. It was the movie blood sport. So there was like a big sumo wrestler who fought like this tiny French kickboxer. There was a boxer who wore like one boxing glove. Hoist Gracie wore his gi. Like it was bananas Crazy. and in some video stores, um, they would have the UFCs in like the porn room because it was like considered just snuff. 
Um, and so that's when I discovered it. So I just, I discovered it in like 1999. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Wow. And I started training in like a shady strip mall um, around that time. Me and my brother started training and he still trains professional fighters and competes. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been at it for forever. But I, I, again, I feel like it wasn't, so I'm 40 now. I feel like it really wasn't until I moved to Texas at like 37, even though I've been training for like 20 years that I was like, oh, being a fighter, it's actually, it's the whole lifestyle. It's how you treat people. It's, it, it's not just going in and being able to like tap out a black belt, you know? Yeah. It's so much more than, you know, brute force, like That's so it. much more. And that and I think that people who kind of aren't familiar with it, which I wasn't, you know, like I only started watching uh UFC, I guess, you know, a couple years ago, really. Yeah. Cause I thought I was like, ah, it's too violent. Like yep. um, and then once you start to understand it, it's then such an art. Yeah. Yeah. You realize like all the, the dude, that may there. that may have been when I started following you on Twitter, where okay. I was just like is that fucking girl that I used to fight with on Twitter and then I met at the Quillette party? Did she fucking watch UFC? And I think I commented because you had a question on oh, something yeah. that happened. And that I was about the slap fight thing. And I was <laughs> like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, is there something I'm missing? Because no. I don't, because again, I don't know that much about no, no, no. fighting. Like Everyone I like watching fighting. I know a little bit, but I'm new to it, right? So I was like, is there something I'm missing here? Because this is horrible yeah. and I can't look at this. No, and every every fighter and MMA journalist I know is like disgusted by it. Okay. Um, so yeah. this, that's just a grift. <laughs> that, that is a grift. If you guys want to. Yeah. Dana White slap fight is a fucking is a grift. Um, so, yeah, man, I've been training forever. Um, but yeah, this whole like fighters ethos, um, I'm taking like really, really seriously now. Um, and again, just kind of like reclaiming masculinity, reading about it, re realizing like, you know, I thought it was just such a talking point, um, from like the right, which by I remember even on the left, I was like, why do, why does the right get all the like cool stuff? Like they get like freedom and like now masculinity. they get this is oh, I racist. Know. Dude, this is like uh, for fascists. I know. Like, what are you doing? To I the said left? that over it's COVID. Like, stay I, fat, stay unhealthy, yeah. stay mentally ill, stay unattractive. Bro. Don't, whatever you do, don't challenge yourself. So wild. So wild. Which, by the way, is the opposite of like empowerment, right? When I saw, yeah. um, I mean, over COVID, I saw so many like, you know, sort of like liberal hippie, use the word plant medicine types, um, go to the right. Because all these gyms were shutting down, especially in the gym and the jiu-jitsu world, all these gyms were shutting down. And it was only like Donald Trump who was like, go get sunlight and exercise. And I was like, is the fucking fat president the only one who's telling people to go to the fucking gym? And liberals were like, if you do a push-up, your great aunt will die or like whatever. It was so insane. And yeah, and now I'm just kind of like, all right, man, well even though I still consider myself at least like a bleeding heart, maybe not in policy. Um, but I, I would rather hang out with conservatives. I would rather learn how to protect myself, how to protect my family. I would rather be fucking confident. Like I, you know, um, and that anyone who knew me or knows me, like these are things I've always believed in. You know what I mean? Like, it's not suddenly like, I'm just like, well, you know, we got to talk about whites being the superior race. Like, I'm just kind of like, I've always, dude, I got in trouble once on my old show because this dude wrote in um, and he was like, my doctor said I'm going to die if I don't lose weight. And I have these three kids. And so I wrote him back. I sent him all these like healthy recipes, although they were vegan at the time. Um, and I found him a jujitsu gym in Baltimore. I was actually just talking to that coach and he like remembers this guy. And you know, wrote him some sappy email and he writes back in like six months later and we read this on the show and I'm almost in tears because at this point I'm like, why am I doing this show? I'm like fucking up my marriage. I'm just so miserable and depressed and suicidal. And but I get this dude's email and I'm so excited to read it where it's essentially like, dude, my doctor said he's never seen such a fast turnaround. My kids are proud of me. I've lost however much weight and I'm entering my first white belt jujitsu tournament um, in a month. And I was like, oh, I'm so proud of you. We're so proud of you, blah, blah, blah. And the next day we got like 10 emails saying that by reading his email, we were fat shaming them. Mm. And I remember I wanted to, and we didn't say anything, but I wanted to lose my mind on the next show where I'm like, 
fat shaming is if you're being mean to a fat person, which I will never be mean to a fat person. Yeah, like if you're picking on them and insulting them or like, right. you know, harassing them or bullying them. But encouraging someone who literally wrote me saying he was going to die, the fact that they would write an email and they would rather that dude orphan his kids than them feel fucking guilty about eating shitty. And again, this is something I see my conservative friends who teach jujitsu. I see them helping people lose weight. And I see those people feeling fucking great about themselves. And I see their kids working out with them and their kids being fucking proud. And to me, it's like, that's doing more good work for the future um, than just shaming people for trying to get healthy. Like, I feel like all these stereotypes that were said to me when I was super liberal that I didn't believe were true. If they weren't true back then, they certainly are true right now of the left, which is why I think so many people are just, they just fucking, they can't do it. And I think cancellation has a big part to do with it because, you know, even the, um, I don't know why I'm voluntarily jumping into controversial shit, but like even the drag show stuff where I disagree with probably a lot of your homies is I do not think that the LGBT community is trying to groom children. I think uh, most of them do not want to f- fuck your kids and they would much <laughs> rather watch Downton Abbey in their cul-de-sac with their husband. Um, but what I do think, and this will get me shit from the other side, is that drag shows are fucking gross for kids. You shouldn't be bringing your kids anywhere fucking near them. And I think the majority of people on the left, even like public people who are supporting this aren't doing this because they're actually like, yeah, fuck yeah, drag shows. They just don't want to get in trouble. And it's the new cool thing. And I think that if we could actually have open conversations, people would be like, hey, man, I don't mind trans people and I don't mind drag shows and I don't mind fucking gay people. But also, like, I don't want my fucking kids anywhere near anything sexual, whether it's heterosexual, whether it's queer, you know. Right. Whatever, but these conversations don't happen because people are. I, I literally think most of the stuff on the left that you guys don't have to worry that it's like less groomers and more just like fucking idiots in Los Angeles, um, who will enable, by the way, actual predators and actual, which is kind of what we were talking about with the whole Me Too thing. Yeah, I mean, they are. I think that the whole thing, I don't necessarily think that the aim of every single drag queen who's doing drag queen story hours to predate on kids. But I think that that is part of like a larger trend that is breaking down boundaries that, you know, people should sort of have. And that I think that they actually do have inherently, but I think that the left has been telling people that if they have these boundaries, they're bigoted and they're judgmental or they're shaming. And so, cause I'm like, what, parent is bringing their child to a drag show right. and it's i think it's because they've been convinced that it's like oh well the right thinks this so therefore i should embrace it this is part of it so like yeah. we just are like knee jerking to everything that's labeled right wing and so we love drag we love trans like we love yeah. irrational like climate hysteria we love being locked down we love having no rights and we hate free right. speech but <laughs> <laughs> but like, and Join you us. know, we're pro-vax regardless of the fact that, yep. you know, this doesn't actually work in the way that it says it does. Yep. Um, so on and so forth. But like they, I think they just, I think they have sort of bought in on some level to the idea that it's teaching their kids to be open-minded about gay. Well, and by the way, there are ways to do that. You know, I haven't really like had this conversation, but like, you know, I have a lot of, uh, I have some, a lot of, I have some trans friends here in Austin and they're awesome. Um, and you know, that's why I've always been really careful where it's like, Hey, I think I can talk about, I think it actually kind of makes me more credible if I can say, Hey, here's the stuff I think is bullshit. Right. I think that you can say, I don't think kids should get hormone blockers. I don't think kids should go to fucking um, drag shows. And you can also say, but don't bully trans people because they're just trying to fucking survive, right? Um, You can have both conversations, but I think there are ways to educate kids about gay rights. Like I would just off the top of my head, I spent most of my life in New York. Like if I was with my like 10 year old or whatever kid and we passed like Stonewall, 
right? Which is a gay bar. I could be like, so hey, this is uh, this is a bar where people who are being oppressed like fought for their rights, just like you'd explain something in like the civil rights movement, like something that is just like not fucking sexual in the slight. It when, when a kid's old enough to learn about like sex education, maybe tens too young, but like how, wh- how whatever age they learn about sex education, it's like also being like, yeah, gay people exist. They're attracted to the same sex. All done. We don't we don't need to like show them a fucking like. So here's Brokeback Mountain or here's like some gay porn. But I think there are ways to do it that are not um, fucking insane. Yeah. And I mean, I just it's the fact that like a kid is just learning about boundaries. Like kids don't have those boundaries yet. Right. And they're being taught to like respect authority and to respect adults. And then they're being put in these situations where there could be potential predators. And that's okay. not the same thing as saying, you know, all of these people are predators, but it is saying that if you're encouraging kids not to be weirded out when an adult is acting inappropriately around them, then you're putting them in danger. Right. I mean, just like, I mean, this probably even goes into our thoughts on porn and kids and and kids watching porn or whatever. But yeah, if you think it's okay just to like go up to a dude and put money in his dress or whatever, it's like, that's not good. It's the same with, um, you know, I mean, an old feminist tr- trope, which I still believe it's like teaching women just that they always have to be nice. Yeah, right? that can be really dangerous. Like I have totally. lots of ex-girlfriends or friends of mine who were sexually assaulted, who were went through horrible things because they just fucking felt bad and they didn't want to say no. And they to didn't want to make things awkward or yep. and their body is just or start screaming fight. that this like, guy is fucking shady. And then they, yeah. you know, they do it anyway. Totally. Same thing, right? Like we don't want to raise kids. We we want to raise women. We want to raise kids. We want to raise gay kids. We want to raise every kid to yeah to have boundaries, to be able to defend themselves, to be able to recognize when there is a predator or when there's danger, how to get help, um, how to stand up for people. You know all these things. And I think that it's like you can do both things. You can teach that, and you can also make sure that they don't hate, that they aren't homophobic that they aren't racist that they aren't you know what i mean like both of those things can happen at the same time and by the way like all the conservatives i know none of them are fucking racist none of them are fucking homophobic none of them are sexist and all of them would agree with you know the things we're talking about right now yeah the i think i mean part of the reason that you know, feminists who used to be my ally, (laughs) (laughs) allies, um, and the leftists who sort of accuse me of having gone right is that I'm like friends with conservatives. I have conservatives on my podcast. I talk to conservatives. I'll sit on panels with conservatives. I'll work with conservatives. And I mean, when, I mean, I got canceled so many times I mean, the left always hated me, even when I was a socialist. I'm also I, I'm using plausible deniability where I actually because I know I'm just not going to log on the Twitter tomorrow. Um, But mm-hmm. I forget all the things you did. And so I'm just like, mm-hmm. I'm just talking to my buddy, my Canadian funny friend. I mean, I think I forget a lot of them, too. Right. Like, I don't even remember. Like when I was I was like, what did me and Jamie fight about? And I was like, could not remember. I was like, I right. probably said something stupid. And he yeah. probably said something stupid. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like I don't remember. I'm like, I know that I had lots of dumb takes like yeah. 10 years ago and like, you know, probably even less than that. Right. Also, but- by the way, I was thinking about you and like how well you're doing. And I'm like, everybody that I fought with back in the day is infinitely more successful than me right now. Like all of them, including like the dude who books all the comedy specials for Netflix who was one of my biggest fans. Um, we argued about like Israel Palestine on Twitter and I was like, you like dead kids and then block them. <laughs> exactly. Um, like I was just such a fucking idiot. Like again, and things I still believe in, I'm not suddenly like fuck Palestine. Like, but I was like, Ooh, we could have done that a little better, buddy. Yeah. I mean, I think like, well, I don't know if I'm more successful. I mean, I guess it depends on success. I'm very happy. I like my life a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> We're both happier. Isn't that wild? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, but yeah, like I, I won it, I guess like when I was canceled, finally, like when I was banned from Twitter for speaking out in defense of women's sex-based rights and for criticizing gender identity stuff and trans activism, um, 
the, uh, so many conservatives and right wing people reached out to me. So I did. And before that, I really hadn't engaged very much with the right at all. I mean, those people just seemed irrelevant to me. Like I never even tried. I never even bothered to try to understand what conservatives thought because I just exactly. had decided they were bad. And then they, when they started contacting me and like supporting me or emailing me, and once I started to get to know a lot of them better, I was like, oh, these are all like really good people. And I think a lot of that just has to do with the fact that like, I mean, they just, they have ethics and they don't, I mean, I shouldn't say all of them, but they seemed to not be living in this culture where ethics and values were just something that you put on the internet. Like they had sort of a standard that they were trying to live by. Yeah. Probably a lot that a lot of that is connected to religion. Yep. Um, oh my goodness. The, I have like so many Christian friends now for the first time. And I'm just like, you got like, I have a whole album. I have an album. I think I may have coined the zombie Jesus term because it was like 15 years ago, like only making fun of Christianity. And now like most of my best friends are Christian and they're just the greatest people <laughs> I've ever met. And granted Christianity can be fucking horrific and weaponized. And you know, when, when, when your organization can be so bad, you make like God look bad. That's very like the, so the president of the Selena fan club, how she makes Selena, you know what I mean? Uh, it's not good. But the, uh, yeah, same deal. Like, that's what I was saying in the beginning, where you just get to know these people. I mean, I remember, this is a little sad, Saki, but maybe you can relate to it. So I'll, I'll, I'll risk it and bring it up. I remember, like, I got hit up by right-wing people. I got hit up by some comedians who, you know, I remember uh, Legion of Skanks, which is very big now. The, um, that's like Dave Smith's. Um, the the head of it, Luis Gomez, right when I got canceled, he wrote me and he just goes, uh, dude, come on the podcast, eat a burger, smack the intern's ass. He's like, you're going to be fucking famous. And it was I didn't respond to him because I was literally Googling how to kill myself. But I remember seeing that and like laughing and being like, oh, you know what? Like comedians will still forgive, you know, right. Um but so because I they understand how flawed people are because comedians are very flawed people and spend yeah. a lot of time talking about how flawed they are. Well, and this is my problem, too, where it's like if I just stayed a comedian and all this stuff happened, who cares? It's not mm -hmm. like actual predatory stuff like Richard Pryor talked about being abusive and doing crack and, you know, every, it's some of the best comedy in the world. Um, but it was because I took myself out of comedy and I was this self-righteous do-gooder that didn't do good. Right. Um, but so to your point about the right wing people, you know, when it first happened, I mean, I didn't want to be a grifter. I wasn't right wing. Um, I didn't have interest in talking to these people. And then I remember when I first went on a right wing show, I think I wrote about this for Quillette. It wasn't because, you know, you don't get paid for these like media appearances. So it wasn't money. I didn't take a book deal. I didn't get a show offer. But I just remember like going to the studio with these people who I just assumed, I don't know what I assumed that they would just be like swastikas hanging up. Like I just like went into the studio and everyone was just so kind. And look, I know when I'm being used, I've been used enough in my life. Um, I can tell when people are fake and disingenuous. I've met people who are fake and disingenuous on the right and on the left in jujitsu and comedy. I have a pretty good fucking radar. I was born in trauma, um, raised in trauma. Um, but it was just so authentic. And I remember it was the first time that like these really like sweet, beautiful women who were like, you know, married with kids and stuff. They were like, that give me a big hug. And I was like, wait, you don't think I'm like a creep? And then be like, oh, sweetie. I'm like, sorry, what happened to you? Like, blah, blah, blah. And it was just the kindness. And I mean, that is the thing with, if you look at Christianity, like the true, if you just look at Jesus, forget Christianity, like the people who are like true Christians, like that's like kind of their whole thing is forgiveness and is like, Hey, we're all flawed and we all fuck up. Um, and that's what I always thought 
the left was. I always thought the left was like, give people another chance. Like, hey, these minorities are struggling. Let's like lift them up. Um, pro prison reform, right? Like, let's re re let's actually like reform these people and help them and get them back into society, which is an antithetical to cancel culture, right? Like, how are we still pro prison reform and want murderers out? But if someone has a bad tweet, we never want them to work again. If someone cheated on their fucking wife, they should go to jail. Like, it's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, I just remember, I mean, this sounds so cheesy, but just feeling like I could be like loved again, or like I could have friends again. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to be careful because that does make it tempting to, I remember there was one night where I was like, maybe I am full conservative and like, I could probably do a show on like the daily wire or something. And I was like, uh, I was like, I'm just gonna like YouTube some like Ben Shapiro. And I started watching Ben Shapiro and I was like, nope, I'm not, I'm not that. That's not me. That's yeah. not me. No. And I mean, like, I'm definitely in the middle. I definitely, I I really love the conservatives who like get shit done. Like again, like the Jockos, the Tulsi Gabber. I mean, Tulsi, like again, Tulsi's in the middle, right? Like, I I like the people who don't just run their mouth and who like do dope shit. Um, and by the way, there are people on the left, like Cornell West. I think like I admire Cornell West the same I admire Jocko, right? Um, these are both just to me, badass, brave people who speak their mind and can piss people off on both sides who have done a lot of good putting their body at risk. Like those are the men I want to emulate. I don't give a shit what side they're on. I mean, I think that fundamentally, like Christian morals are good. Yeah. Um, obviously like organized religion has gotten off track in a lot of different ways, depending on what religion you're talking about and, and very bad things have been done in the name of religion, but at, at their core, those morals are very good and they're standards that everyone should try to live by. But of course they don't because they don't have religion and because the left has sort of rejected morals. Like they yeah. they treat, they treat morals as a bad thing. Like whenever I was criticizing prostitution or pornography i would always get accused of moralism and then at a certain point i was like no 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 that's not what i'm doing not and then at a certain point i was like wait 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 morals aren't a bad thing like no. what, <laughs> what are you it, talking about the more boundaries i have set for myself the more i kind of live my life like a conservative christian um i read that you said like didn't you say you found god i mm -hmm. didn't realize so what so are you a christian now? yeah yeah and again i didn't okay. uh i didn't like write a big piece about it or because i was just like it it's so real to me and it feels so good that i was like i don't even need to fucking I don't Did you grow up a in thing. a religious household? Not really. So like we were like kind of Jewish and kind of Christian in the sense that we celebrated Christmas and Hanukkah and never went to church and never went to synagogue. Okay. Um, so like I didn't do any. I mean, really. I I mean, shit, I spoke at the Global Atheist Convention. I opened for Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. I always called myself agnostic, even when I was an atheist, because, you know, if God, it would have been, it, it's, it's as presumptuous to say, you know, for a fact, there's no God. Um, and uh, the main reason I got drawn to atheism was just because well, one, I had no backbone and my wife was an atheist and I was like, you're smart. Okay. Um, but I, I, but I was against religion. Um, cause it was under George Bush. I started getting, you know, sort of well-known under George Bush. And I was talking about same, I was defending gay marriage. I was against the war in Iraq. Um, and really the only person I heard talking about Jesus was George Bush. And like, it doesn't matter how good your band is. If the only dude hype in that band is fucking George Bush or Mike Pence, I'm like, Ugh, like I'm not on board. Right. And so because I was speaking out against those things, I just started getting invited to like atheist conventions and stuff. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm not, not that, I guess, you know what I mean? Like I'm against organized religion, but even when I spoke at the reason rally, which was like, you know, in front of 30 to 50,000 people, um, I added a line at the end where I said, I would rather hang out with a Christian who wants to feed the poor than you know, something like some atheist who's just going to like bitch on Reddit or something. Um, and that's sort of how I always felt. And I remember when I started reading like atheist books, all I wanted to do is debate people and like practice my Richard Dawkins talking points and shit. And ever since going to church, I just, 
I feel different. I feel changed like on a second to second basis that I'm like, oh, like I can't even quote scripture really. I just know that this makes me better um, and that I believe it really strongly. Um, and so, yeah, man, I'm just, my whole thought process was I started reading about just Jesus and I'm like, I like that. I want to help people who need help. I want to hold myself more accountable. I want to be more loving. I want to be more forgiving. Um, also really sweet having someone who's like, I love you no matter what. And I'm like, oh, good. Jesus can Google me and he'll still love me. Um, so that's a bonus. And I got really lucky that the first church I went to in Austin, because I always thought of, and my ex, um, my ex-girlfriend had some like really horrific church baggage and what's cool about finding it at 40 is i got no baggage so even the cheesy songs i'm like fucking i'm in i'm all in um but a lot of my friends who were like raised in the church have so much baggage from it because it was all about shame and telling you you're bad and fear which is the complete opposite of like new testament jesus and so the church i went to they opened by saying he opened yesterday. He was just like, hey, if you're new and you don't know, like we are flawed people, very much including the person who's about to preach the sermon. Um, and they open with that. And then with even the donations at the end, they tell people if you need money, like take money. Um, and that I love. They're not acting like they're above anything. They're like, hey, we're all fucking up. And like, we want to be more like Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking all in. Interesting. I mean, and another, I mean, I, I wanted to talk to you about um, the fact that you quit porn a little bit more. And part of what I just realized I found interesting was that the whole time that you were a male feminist, mm -hmm. you were, I'm presuming you were using porn and probably thought it was fine and good because, you know, that that version of feminism and progressivism i think was very accepting of porn. um and then i when like you were to call it supporting <laughs> sex workers every time i exactly. jerked off the porn hub i was like this is for equality i'm and supporting I'm like, sex um, work yeah <laughs> i'm fighting the patriarchy <laughs> literally these guys like logan oh. paul and like all these guys who are like advocating porn and are always having porn stars on their podcasts and they're yeah. talking about sex work is work that um Ugh, what is his freaking name? Uh, like they're like super uber like progressive lefty guys who've gotten quite famous and are making tons and tons of money on Twitch and YouTube yeah. and stuff. Who are always, you know, shitting on anyone who is opposed to prostitution, pornography. They all say over and over and over again, "Oh yeah, well, because you know I support sex work and I support sex workers, and you know the only reason that people don't like." pornography and prostitution is because they're patriarchal and they grew up in these Christian conservatives homes and they're misogynist. So they hate, they hate sex workers. And it's like, no, that's not the only reason. Like I've never, it's not about hating sex workers. It's right. for me in any case, I'm sure there's people out there who hate women in porn and prostitution. And we talked like, to some of them like, on Twitter that one. Yeah. Night, when yeah, I that's tried to bring true. everyone together and got yelled at by some angry ladies. <laughs> but I mean, even them, like they're critical of the guys who are using porn and the guys sure. who are making porn and the guys who are selling porn and the guys who are buying sex and so on and so forth. Like it's such a stupid, thoughtless comforting lie I, that I, if you use pornography or you pay for sex you're supporting i'm supporting women like, yeah i you know i have some friends who are porn stars um one of my really good friends um nicole aniston i haven't talked to her in a while but you know i, I would ask her these things on the podcast because and i would do it really delicately because uh, again just like every fucking argument um on the internet it's like either you're ban all guns or you're arm everybody either you are completely pro-choice and fucking think you should get an abortion you know you can change your mind when the kids fucking you know one or uh you 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 hate women right because you want to save a cell over when like everything becomes so hyperbolic that yeah i i remember even when i was on the left i would I would just have these thoughts where it's like, I mean, do all, do all the, are all the women like cool with this, you know, or you would hear stuff about sex trafficking. And I would ask people again, like low key, like off the record, like, why is it just conservatives talking about sex trafficking? That seems like a feminist issue. And then like, I would never get these like straight answers. And 
you know, to me, it's like, I, I will always support, maybe not always. I, I, I will support women who are doing a thing that they, that makes them happy on their own, you know, whatever. Um, but what I always thought was like, and I always said this is so like so many jujitsu girls, for example, they have like only fans or, or, very or comedians now. yeah. And so it's like, is there a way where it's like, because the only pushback they get is usually from actual sexist guys, which is like these fucking sluts making money. I can't show my dick and make money. It's like, well, right, but no one wants to see your angry dick. Um, <laughs> but like, I think you should be able to say, Hey man, if this girl, this makes her feel sexually empowered and she's making a lot of money and she loves it, which like, mm, I don't know. Um, cool. But also wouldn't it be more like feminist forward to make jujitsu a sport where women can make enough money that they don't have to sell feet pictures. You know what I mean? Like, shouldn't we be actually trying to empower women where if they don't want to do it, which I feel like a I lot of them feel like most of them are enjoying themselves. I think that that's while what I'm trying so hard not only to fans, well, I mean, I feel I I say it all the time, and part of it is because I've talked to lots of women who've been in porn and prostitution, and they all say that they hated it, and that even that it made them hate sex. But like, while you're in it, you have to say that you like it because that's the whole fa fantasy and this whole game. Like, no guy right. is gonna well, not no guy because some guys are gonna like the fact that you don't like it, but the guys want that fantasy of like, so that they don't have to feel bad about it. Right. Like, Oh, she yeah. just, she's a hedonist. Like, or she just, you know, yeah. she's, she loves having sex and she just loves gangbangs and yeah. she just loves showing her pussy to strangers on the internet, which like nobody really does. And if you do, I'm sorry, but you're mentally unwell. And I don't I mean you're crazy necessarily. I mean, like that's not what a really confident, a woman who actually is a confident person does. Like I, I've never, had that desire and like i just i don't i don't feel like i need that kind of validation yeah i to your point i definitely would never want to be with an escort and be like hey when i come tell me what your real dreams are like that's very upsetting and sad um you know the way i've been talking about porn because i haven't done the research and statistics i know that i've never jerked off and been like bad boy like i've never been like let's go seize the day like yeah, for me like i'm like well, really great about yourself and inspired yeah so like i'm not taking it from any sort of i've learned my lesson i'm not taking it from any sort of like feminist standpoint <laughs> i'm just sort of like well for me and i think for a lot of dudes that i talk to who don't talk about it a lot um we don't feel great so I wanted to look into that for myself and again, not do the old Jamie thing where it's like, well, now that I don't, you know, like porn, I'm going to be an anti porn crusader. Although I have whole stand up bits about it, even before I stopped watching it about why I stopped watching it, about how porn got so mean and every video on Pornhub, like I was like, I literally have a joke where I'm like, all I want to see when I watch porn is two people hotter than me have consensual sex and you can't find that. Like you have to literally Google porn for women if you want to find just like consensual sex. So I have a right. whole bit about that. I have a bit about every video on Pornhub. It's just like, well, just trick this dumb slut into a van. And I'm like, I just want to come. I don't want to be accessory to a crime. Like plus like all the weird stepsister shit. Like there's so much weird shit happening. Um, and I just thought about it from my point of view. And from my point of view is I have enough issues with sex. Um, from the tattered playboys I found in the woods, I can't imagine, and I have enough insecurities and I have enough, all these fucking issues that I can't even imagine if I had access to it with my little 16 year old broken brain. And I could just look at, yeah, gang bangs. I could look at stuff like that on my fucking phone. I think about how I would feel that addictive pull sometimes as an adult who didn't grow up on it. Um, I would, I was talking to a friend this week who was like, dude, whenever I like watch porn, like me and my girl, like don't have as much sex. And I'm like, right. Because you're not 
flirting with her because you're depleted. You're depleted. You're why are you going to flirt with her or try or risk rejection when you can just go like jerk off. Right. And like how well, sad- because you've probably created all these like fantasies that are now like now what you fantasize about is not your girlfriend. Like you're fantasizing about these. I'm probably mostly like degrading, humiliating, but, you know, kind of extreme and definitely not real scenarios with these people that you don't even know who, I mean, aren't even really enjoying themselves. But so so you're focusing energy on on these things rather than on her. I think for a lot of people that could happen. Um, I think especially for kids, you know, when I think about I lost my virginity shakily telling my girlfriend I love her so nervous you know like only missionary for like a year um I can't imagine some poor girl losing her virginity and some dude like choking her and like coming on her face like that sounds Mm -hmm. so horrific I would be Um, trauma like I feel like that would be traumatic if that happened well and then I mean I had a hard enough time when you're like having sex with dudes who don't respect you, never mind with all these like violent dude. porn scenarios and this degrading stuff. Dude, I, I I have a whole bit about like, it's hard to date girls who grew up on hardcore porn because I grew up on romantic comedies and I like tell part of a story, but it is true where a girl asked me to hit her. And like the joke is I'm just like, you're a cop. Like I'm not gonna fucking hit you. But like the reality of it is, I remember just being like, do you really want that? Or did someone like, like that and they're like well someone like like that and i was like i don't want to do that to you and i think so now you have guys who are being maybe even more aggressive or violent than they even want to but then they start to associate that with whatever power or sex then you have these women who are like asking for it um and maybe they like it i mean they're definitely like kink is real like there are girls who like certain things that other girls don't whatever um but I think a lot of girls are asking for things that maybe they don't want because they think the guy wants it. Yeah. And um, and it's a fucking – it's a mess. But what I was going to say to your point about – I think sometimes it can be even simpler. Like and, – and, and and there are probably a lot of guys listening that are like, I'm, I, I watch porn and I'm not suddenly like, oh, man, I wish there were also like 10 black guys here fucking my wife. Like – or I wish, you know, there were, there were two other women or, you know, I wish you got stuck under a table. Like I don't think – that happens as much like for me it really was i would rather jerk off than get rejected Mm. it was and now as i think a much better more confident man i was like i would rather have a conversation with my partner about why we're not having sex what i can do what she can do if there's a reason it fell off if she had insecurities if there's something she wants me to do that I'm not doing, you know, if there's blah, blah, something blah. you're not communicating about and she's not feeling close to you or right. she's feeling like upset with you, but saying that she's not talking to you about like, there's so many yeah. things that can I, impact. I had a girl, relationship. I, I, I had a girlfriend recently who was sexually abused um, a long time ago, but she was like, she, she's like, please don't ask me for sex. Like that's just a trigger for her. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh, a big thing for me is rejection. So I was like, "Uh oh, <laughs> like, how do we do this? And how we did it was she was like, if you want chances are, I want to have sex with you. But she's like, just flirt, just come up and like kiss the back of my neck when I'm cooking and then walk away. Right. Like just shit like that. Yeah. And we did it. And it was great. Like we, it was great. Like our sex life was great. Um, but there were definitely times where I would get like nervous about being rejected And, you know, I'd get home a little later and I would just be like, well, I don't want to get rejected. And like, I can't really flirt because she's like brushing her teeth and shit. So I'm just going to go downstairs and just jerk off and then just go cuddle and go to sleep. And I felt disgusting. I felt rejected anyway. I felt gross. I felt like a 16 year old kid sneaking around. And like what I should have done was had more fucking willpower and been like, all right, we're not having sex tonight. That's fine. And then gone to bed or whatever. And I I realized that like we do have sexual urges and, you know, you don't, you don't want to get so pent up. You turn into a fucking psychopath. Um, But I don't think that porn is actually giving people the gratification they think. I think it's um, an easy out. And I think it's wiring our brain to actually kind of be unattractive to women. Um, And, you know, this is the longest I've been single. I've been like purposely single because I'm trying to wait for a relationship and porn 
seems like such an easy answer now. I've been more tempted than ever um, because I go and have like totally caved and watched porn. And the times I've done it, it's been because let's say some girl wants to have sex with me. And I was like, no, I'm going to wait till I'm in a relationship. And I say no to her. I'm like, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll watch porn because that's better than having sex with a human. And then I watch it and then I go, I just, I hate myself. I feel gross. What I should have done was read a book or meditated or take, took a, taken a walk. I will say where I will give my Christian friend shit is one of my friends goes, bro, if you don't want to jerk off every time you're horny, just read the Bible. And I was like, that sounds <laughs> awful. I don't want to be horny reading the Bible. <laughs> like Jamie's spending a lot of time on that prostitute. Like, I want nothing. That's the worst idea I've ever heard. So yeah. Christian friends don't suggest that to other people. I mean, do you, what do you think about that? claim that you know that says well men have to watch porn because otherwise they'll rape more otherwise they'll be more violent <laughs> otherwise they'll that. hate women i mean people say that to me all the time like the well, that you know and all the like all from women and men everybody who's who wants to say porn is fine porn is harmless porn is just a fantasy paying for sex is fine it's as long as it's all consensual as long as everybody signed a contract as long as everybody's getting paid all good nothing more to talk about those people will also go so far as to defend paying for sex and defend using porn to say otherwise what would what would men do they'll be going around raping women all the time and they'll be so angry and they'll be awful well i think like anyone who thinks men are going to be so angry and raping are probably watching weird porn and <laughs> that's where they're getting that idea from um i'm going to all right here's what i'm gonna say i've had my comments turned off for anyone listening, if you've liked me even a tiny bit, go listen to my podcast, Advice Not Taken. Please feel free, free to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Let me get something out of this because I'm about to tell you about how I jerked off this week. Um, and I <laughs> did not think I would be talking about this on the podcast. So uh, got, got, got an offer for sex. Got an offer for sex. Knew we weren't going to be in a relationship. She said, that's fine. Very tempting. Uh, this has been the longest I haven't had sex. And I was just like, I will not feel good about myself. And even though she says it's fine, I don't, I think she wants more. I'm not going to risk it. I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to go back on the things I said. So I do my normal bullshit where I go, all right, I'm very horny. Now I'm as horny as you can get. I'm a very sexual person. I haven't had sex in six months. Um, occasionally I'll get really lonely and like depressed. Um, and uh, I can also say no part of me was like, I was going to rape a lady um, or be violent or I mean, fuck, man, I've done. Or like, I'm so pent up that I'm going to like hit a woman or something yeah. like that. I'm like, so I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to go women. sneak over to my neighbor's house and peer yeah. through a window. Oh, and also, like, by the way, like I was at the pool today and the bathing suits women wear now are not the bathing suits of yonder. <laughs> um, I mean, it's like, like I'm can watching... you guys please put some clothes on? <laughs> it's a lot. So like, I'm just like looking at the ground. I'm like looking at the ground. I'm looking at my book. I feel like I've walked into the woman's locker room by accident. Um, but again, I'm so horny, you guys, and I'm not judging and I'm not looking and I'm not like, I'm fine. But the realization I had, and the only reason I'm talking about this, because you might find it interesting, is that I was like, and this has happened a couple times, actually, where I was like, all right, well, I'm really horny, so I'm going to jerk off. And the easy way to do it is you watch porn because that's quicker. You just see mm -hmm. a woman that you've never seen before. And she takes off her clothes and you realize like, oh my God, I could be having sex with this woman. And she's doing things that you want to be doing right now. And then you come really fast, which by the way, guys who are trying to quit porn, um, if you don't give a shit about like women and sex trafficking and like what is doing to your brain, it's also going to make you come a lot quicker because you're training yourself to come really fast because you're just shamefully like just trying to like end it. You're not like no one's right. watching porn and I've never lit candles. Like, I was just going on for hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not setting the mood. I didn't like have a little like fancy dinner for in front of my laptop. <laughs> um, I'm sadly jerking off, praying that like God's not real, and it's horrible. Uh, so you, so you, you're gonna come really fast. The times that I've been in like the healthiest sexual relationships where we're having sex like multiple times a day for as long as we want, it's cause no porn's involved because I'm having a lot of sex. So I don't want to watch porn. So like I'm used to that connection anyway, but I know if I just want to, if we're on like DEFCON emergency code red, 
there's a girl who wants to fuck me. She says she'll come over right now. I know if I just turn on porn, I'll problem solved. Um, so what's happened the last couple of times I've thought about porn is I've just been like, okay, well, I don't want to watch porn, but I can still get off. So I'll get into bed and I'll start to get off and I like, won't be that into it. And then my first instinct is just go watch porn. Cause then you'll get off. But right. then my second instinct is, or maybe you just don't need to jerk off as bad as you think. Right. And then I'll go, okay, I don't need to do this. And then I'll go to bed and I'll go to sleep and I'll wake up fine. And I won't wake and up. And you'll be morning. okay. And you live. Yeah. And then <laughs> by the way, the times that I have been super pent up or, you know, there was a girl like I hooked up with, but we didn't have sex and I'm like super like whatever I will go home and with no fucking problem no porn needed be able to jerk off and it feels great. And I definitely don't feel the near amount of shame, if any shame, yeah. um, because that was just like a thing that could really happen. It was based on reality. It, um, you know, I was a little pent up. I was like hooking up with someone, whatever. And yeah. So these times that it just becomes really habitual, just like everything becomes habitual, you know? Um, I was just talking to my brother before this podcast where I think one of the reasons I was depressed today is because I am talking to a girl. And so because of that, I check my phone first thing in the morning, which I never do. My morning routine is I read before I check my phone, but I want to see if this girl wrote me. So I see if this girl wrote me, but now I'm on my phone and I'm waiting for her to text. So I'm like, well, I might as well go to Instagram. I might as well look at Twitter. And now I'm like completely fucked up. Like my day is just trashed. And there's that same compulsive thing with porn but then you add sex you add naked women and now it's like i mean times a fucking thousand it's i mean it's interesting that you explained that aspect of it which is just like you can come a lot faster because for some reason because I, I guess that that seems obvious when you say it but i never really thought about it that way and i think that partly that's because because i talk to a lot of men about porn in my private life and yeah. you know in terms of like my work and stuff like that in terms of people i'm interviewing and stuff like that but no one's ever said you know uh, so a lot of men will say, well, you know, like, what do you like? You think we shouldn't masturbate? Like, what are we supposed to do if we're not having sex? And I'm always like, well, you can still masturbate like without watching porn. Like, I don't understand what happened. Like, what did people do before the Internet? Like right. when you didn't always have access to porn, I'm pretty sure men were still masturbating. Like, yeah. no, I don't have a problem with masturbating. I have a problem with pornography for a lot of various reasons. But what they never have explained is that, oh, it's just easier to get off like you can get off a lot faster and it's i guess yeah. more convenient because i was like can't you just fantasize about something yeah. like can't you just do something that feels good but and i also Start being you know, more creative you pussies stretch that <laughs> imagination out Come yeah on. and the fact that you're i think that what a lot of men maybe don't want to admit is that like yeah you can be like oh okay maybe i just don't have to do this tonight and i'll be okay and whatever yeah. i'm not this is not as urgent as i thought it was yeah. Well, and it's funny because taking, taking sex off the table, um, until I'm in a relationship has like really given me time to like, this is the longest I've been, maybe not the longest I've been totally single, but I don't know. It's been like a while since I've had a relationship and I've very purposefully just been like, I'm trying to find myself. So when I meet someone, I'm like, I'm a man I'm proud of, right. Mm -hmm. Or the most proud of so far. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've had a lot. It's wild when I've I've only been like a relationship guy. And so to have so much time to myself to kind of like analyze this and think about this. And there are times I think I'm just going fucking crazy, like pacing around my apartment, being like thinking about my masturbation habits. Um, but yeah, man, it's uh, there are so many things that we're told are just normal or good or whatever that and, and but but the problem is they're addictive. Right. It's like so much food that we were fed as kids. Like now we know it's bad, but it's also kind of like you see adults drinking soda and you're just mm -hmm. like, what the, What are you doing? Are you five? But then you're mm -hmm. like, well, you grow up on that and, and then think add it's that it's, you think it's normal and then add that it's addictive. It's physically yeah. addictive. Yeah. The phone is physically addictive. Sex can be emotionally addictive. Combine those things and you're fucked. Yeah, junk food and processed food, almost all of it is addictive. It has stuff in it that's addictive. People are addicted to sugar. And yeah, I mean, you can have 
an addictive relationship to all sorts of things. Um, a lot of these things have like physical impacts that make you actually addicted. I think like porn probably like rewires your brain in particular ways that it are very powerful because it's connected to this dopamine response because it's connected to orgasms. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, there's another thing which is, I don't want to sound like a fucking like no fap red pill dude, but it is true, which is when I spent so much time looking at porn, when you can get off so easily with no questions asked, you could be spending that time trying to be a man who's more fuckable or yeah. who's a better partner or who's a better boyfriend or who's a better lover or who's a better communicator when it comes into relationships. And the more you focus on that, like I go to the gym more now and that will make me a better partner or, yeah. or a more attractive partner instead of just the, the, the easy road. Right. Which is um, just, jerking off the the porn like i want instant to... gratification yeah that like, doesn't really do anything that doesn't benefit you or anyone else in well any that's way. like with everyone that's like you know the people who <clears throat> all they do is you know leave negative comments on like podcasts or on people's twitters or whatever and it's like hey man you know if you spent all that time that you're shitting on other people you could maybe make something yourself and like yeah. It could be good. It could be what you want to hear. Um, same with this. It's like, and the fact that so much of the sort of like the people who do hate women, like they're going to porn and that porn is good. Dude, like I get, when I would just casually watch porn and see the stuff. And again, I'm not searching for it. I'm not searching for like violent porn. It would just be on the normal generic porn site and just be called like, you know, aggressive or like whatever. And like, yeah, the girls look fucking miserable. It's horrible. Like, I don't I don't like it at all. I've seen porn that's not that as well. Um, and like I said, I've heard from porn stars who have horrible experiences. And I talked a little bit about this on your Twitter um, live. And then I've talked to porn stars who seem really happy. Um, but for me, it's more a concern about, like, me and then young men. Um I can speak on them more than women. And actually with young men comes young women who have to have sex with those men. Um, and then obviously it's like, I just never heard about the sex traffic. Like when I was on the left, I just never heard about the sex trafficking. I never heard about that stuff. And when you did, you, it was just, if it was, it was from the right. And so you go, Oh, this is probably just some sexist. They just don't want women to have sex. And like, that's as far as we took that research. Like I just hear that and go, okay, well, I don't want to talk about that then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, and again, like that's another thing that people sort of deny, which is that, you know, people will say like, oh, well, like you're just talking about this niche category of degrading violent pornography. I mean, what about, what about the, just the regular pornography? And I'm like, no, no, I'm talking about the regular pornography. I'm talking about what okay. you see when you Hold go to on. Pornhub. I trust my, I trust my willpower enough. Can you still hear me? Yeah. And see me. I'm going to Pornhub right now. I'm in an incognito browser. Um, okay, the first one. And so Pornhub, this is just the generic one. I slap her red big lips with my big meat dick. I mean, that's poetry. Um do do do. Um, I'm going to visit my parents' house. Someone comes to fuck me, slutty stepsister. Um, desperate for money, come dumpster. Oh God! Like, um, see, this is yeah. exactly like. I mean, this is anybody the, this who is says, "Oh, but I'm just watching page. the regular porn." I'm like, you liar! Yeah. You're the one using porn. I don't even use porn, and I know it's on Pornhub, yeah. and you know it's on Pornhub because you're there. And how do you have the balls to just say, "Oh, well, yeah"? What about? I'm just watching this like regular amateur porn. I'm not watching any of this like barely legal stepsister, Dude, father, so, babysitter, slapping, facial abuse stuff. Every like, time please. every time I make those jokes on stage about the slapping, about the stepsister stuff, the entire audience is laughing in recognition. Like I I have, I'm not going to do the bit, but I have a whole bit about if I just want to watch normal sex, you literally in Pornhub have to type in porn for women. Like, and it's just like essentially like my porn's just like, calling me a, a girl like it's mocking me and so like you have to type it in because it's just assume 
that guys want to see all that other fucking shit. And by the way, like there, there, there definitely was a point where there was one relationship I was in where I was watching more porn than usual because of the rejection thing. And she was younger. Um, not like creepy young, but she was like 28. So like younger than me. Um, and she came from like a kind of shitty aggressive relationship. Um, and so her kind of her instinct was to, you know, want that kind of stuff, want that kind of dirty mm-hmm. talk, want mm-hmm. that kind of like physical. And well, so she then, probably associated it with being attractive. Like she thought, Oh, she, you really want me. She, then you're yeah. going to say these things or she did. like, yeah. Yep. And then because I was watching that porn, I was like, Oh, okay. Maybe I'm into that. And then finally we just like slowly stopped doing that and then had a much better um, sex life. But we were like, Oh, did we both? just think this is what we were supposed to do. And don't get me wrong. Like when a girl does something that I'm not used to at first, um, like there is part of me that I'm like, Ooh, this is different. Like I've been having sex for a lot of years. Like there's like a, a uniqueness factor. Like I remember I just used to make fun of girls who said daddy. And I'm like, that's weird. I don't get it. Do I call you daughter? What's happening? And then the first time a girl said it, I was like, Oh, that's kind of hot. And I realized it was hot only because I've heard it in porn. And that made me feel like I was in porn. And then afterwards I felt kind of like, I didn't like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, That's weird. Yeah. But it was just like new for me and I related it to porn. So I was like, okay, I guess that's like what like real hot sex is. And it's like, no. I mean, it's, yeah, it's partly to do with feeling desired because that's what you've equated with feeling desired. Like for for women also, I'm not saying you necessarily, but, and then also the, you know, like it's, it's a turn on to turn somebody else on. So I think that part of what, I mean, sometimes it's girls just saying things because they think that's what the guy wants them to say. They want him to think she's super sexy and sexual and hot and like this, like badass and better, whatever. And she knows what she's looking, he's looking at on Pornhub and she wants to like replicate that because she right. thinks he's into it. But also it's like, oh, well, I'm doing this and he's getting turned on and turning other people on is yep. a turn on. So she's confusing or conflating that with feeling turned on herself and not even necessarily confusing because maybe she is get turning, tur- getting turned on by right. that. But right, right, still, right, right, right. it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, chicks like being slapped, chicks right. like being choked. Chicks like it when you like come on their face, like yeah, like oh well she came. I'm like okay, that doesn't that doesn't inherently need well good. Right? Yeah. I mean, dude, you woke Jamie had a whole joke about like not getting cum shots. Like, like I just didn't understand them. Um, yeah, I think that you know, and I remember too when I was like <laughs> when I was like super liberal, I would be afraid to be like they would say like they'd want something that's like graphic or violent and i would be afraid to be like do you really want that because then i'm like well i don't want a mansplain on top of things uh <laughs> so i would just be like no she's an empowered woman and she knows what she wants i guess yeah and you know it's 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 so frustrating because yes i want women to be completely empowered and do what they want also i feel like society is telling them they want things that maybe they don't want. And it's like, and that might be harmful to them. Yeah. Or harmful to other women. Even take it out of like a whole sex category. It's, you know, our generation is the most, we're allowed to do whatever we want. We're allowed to say whatever we want. We don't have fucking, you were talking about this before. We don't have rules. We don't have boundaries. We're super liberated, whatever. And we have the highest depression and suicide rates. Yeah. Uh, of all time like we got what we want we have yeah. secular societies where it's like we're just like looking out for us um and it's not good everything is at our fingertips we can like order literally anything to our houses i mean if you live in urban areas in particular like i can Amazon, order a lady to my house yeah, yeah to have sex with you can get instant porn you can get instant yep. sex instant Dating food sites. instant any tv you want and yet everyone seemingly is having mental health issues yep yeah, well, and, and you know, I, I was talking to, um, I was talking to a buddy of mine who was having trouble with porn, and he was like, you know, I stopped looking at porn, and then I got back on fucking dating sites. And again, this is something I don't want to admit because I, I don't go on dating sites, um, at all. But the times I have, 
I go, be honest with me, man. Was there part of you when you got on the dating site? Cause it was on the same device. Did it feel sort of, cause it has for me. Oh my God. These are a bunch of women who could fuck me. Yeah. And you're not going, even I've gone on dating sites looking for a relationship. You know what I mean? Like I, I had my LA relationship was from fucking hinge. Um, I'm not, I'm also like, I'm not like, dude, I'm very like relationship guy. I'm not, I don't do great on like Tinder. Cause I don't look like guy. You just want to fuck at a bar. Like I'm not that kind of hot. I'm like sad, broken. I need to fix him hot. Um, and, uh, and so I don't even do well, like looking to get laid. I'm like, I'm looking for relationships, but when I'm looking at porn and then I go on an app, which you're using the same fucking fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's part of me that like, I start to get like turned on because yeah. I'm like, Oh, these are all girls who are like ready to fuck. And that is, I did. I do not like my brain. I don't want my brain like that. Like at all. Yeah. I've thought about that before too. And uh, yeah. And I think, and I think I've talked to people about this before also, but the fact that men are going on these dating apps and treating it sort of like pornography or like only fans, it's like they're swiping through these like sexy sexualized photos yeah. of these pretty girls and then maybe they can get them to send nudes or maybe they can like get them to come se send them a video maybe they can get them to like facetime like sex stuff maybe they can get them to come over and fuck them like it's right. i think it does it does i mean i think part of it is that it's just so superficial and visual like it's just photos for the most part yeah but then also yeah i mean men are using pornography on their phone and then they're they're going from the porn to the dating app and back Just to the porn. Like, like of course yeah. it's going to get all yeah. hooked in together. Yep. Can I ask you, I'll let you go soon. It's been almost two hours and I know you're super tired. And yeah, I, don't know. I mean, this conversation is like, I could talk about this kind of stuff all day, but I am so tired. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll let you go just after <laughs> I'll let you go shortly, yeah. I, but I am wondering, so you, so you've been single for six months and yeah. you're not having casual sex. You're not casually dating because you're yeah. looking for a relationship. Is this like, was there a certain point where you kind of decided, like, are you looking to get married? Like, what's the plan here? Um, so I think like in a perfect world, the plan is, yeah, the plan is like my goal is to get married. I would like to have a family. Yeah. Um, am I going to go full? 80s Christian youth pastor, as my pastor jokingly said. Are you looking Sunday. for a Chadway? Yeah. And I'm going to like, you know, just have to like meet a Christian and get married in like four months so we can have sex. Um, you know, realistically, I'm probably going to have sex, but I do not want to do it until I'm in a relationship. And, you know, it it, it is, I've never talked about this. Um, it is tied into religion, but not in a, I'm going to go to hell if I have sex before marriage. Um, it was just sort of explained to me in a way of, cause you know, I've already, I've already made all those mistakes. Um, it was explained to me in a way that, well, two things. So the non-religious version is that when, when casual sex was on the table, I could spend time pursuing that instead of pursuing the man I want to be in a relationship when I got lonely, instead of examining that, instead of examining the feelings, I could just get laid, right? Um, and I could temporarily feel good about myself. But then when I think about how I feel afterwards, much like drinking with a hangover, it wasn't good, let alone um, if the girl wanted more, if the girl got hurt or if, I, you know, I felt but whatever. Um, and you know what, to be totally honest with you, just so I don't sound like a total self-righteous you know, whatever. There's also part of me that I've moved into relationships so fast before because of my history and because I want to be done telling this fucking story about what mm -hmm. happened to me and mm -hmm. giving the reasons I had the affair and all these things. And yeah, explaining to girlfriends, parents like that. I'm not a fucking sexual predator. And like with telling a 70 year old what an open relationship is when you're like dating his daughter, like not fun. Um, so but also like something about being canceled is like if I have a one night stand with a girl who says she's cool with a one night stand and then she's not cool with a one night stand and she wants to make some shit up and then just go, look, this dude's been a creep before and he treated me shitty. That can happen. So like that's been a thought of mine. Um, it's not the main reason, but it's certainly like I definitely have more walls up, I think. 
Um, and then the, the, the Christian reason is that I have tried the other way before, you know, I usually like oftentimes like sleep with a girl on a first date and the relationships become very much about sex. And, um, the way my pastor was talking about it again, it wasn't in a shameful way. He had sex before marriage. It was in a, Hey, I just want you to have the best relationship possible. I'm not mm -hmm. saying this because you're going to fucking go to hell or whatever. Um, but he's like, develop the friendship. That's it. And when I thought about it, I'm like, God, sex has been such a, like the main focus on the relationship. And I think a lot of it does have to do with, well, that's how it starts. Totally. And then again, it becomes addictive. It becomes primal. I mean, the fact that I can go, you know, days without masturbating, months without looking at porn, months without sex. And if I had sex with my girlfriend, like less than three times a day, I felt rejected. It's like, that's not good. That's not healthy, you know? And so I just want to try something different. It's not judgment. It's not, but what's cool is like, this has led to examining porn. This, that has led to how I look at, you know, women. Um, and these are all really like healthy byproducts. Um, it does suck sometimes like today I just got really lonely because when you don't have these hookups on the table, even though I'm getting like, I'm getting more shit offers thrown at me than usual. And I think it's probably tied into not looking, not being thirsty or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you feel extra lonely because at least before I knew I could get laid. Whereas now I'm like, am I ever going to meet a wife? Like, it just seems like I have so many, um, uh, like boundaries and sort of like things I'm looking for that now, instead of fantasizing about like hooking up with a girl after a show, I'm like fantasizing about like marrying a woman at church. And like, that's not great either. Um, I'm trying just to be like present and disciplined and whatever. But, um, but then when I think about it is even though like, so today, for example, I was lonely and I'm like, God, am I ever going to meet a girl? Well, I go, well, if the old me would have just had sex with someone that I didn't want to be in a relationship with today, that's what I would have done. Um, how is that going to help me meet the right girl? And in fact, will that actually bring me back further because now I've dropped my bar a little bit and what I've maybe even settled just to be in a relationship with her. Cause now we can have sex every day when maybe I didn't like her as much as I wanted to, but I'd go, Oh, well, it'll, it'll happen. Instead of now I'm just basing everything on, you know, do we have shared values? Do we have the same goals? And before my, my bar was, will you fuck me? And if you would fuck me, I will fuck you. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of it. Like, will you, will you love me? Okay, I'll love you. Do you want to move in? Let's move in. Like, I was just so not confident and would define myself by relationships. And so, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> like an yeah. idiot. Oh, I know. I mean, I think it's like a great path. And it's, and it's really hard to do. And I think Sorry. that you're right. Like, it's like you you start relationships based on sex and then that's what the intimacy is formed around. That's what the connection is formed around. And it's not necessarily what's going to make for a good relationship. I mean, dude, my best relationships were when I was like 19 and we waited like maybe just a couple months, but those months were so exciting. And right. then, and they were so fun. And, it, and, and by the way, it was hot. It was hot not having sex right away. It was hot, like taking our time and wanting it more and whatever. And then we had this whole like friendship and we already had inside jokes. And, and not that I haven't had that with relationships that were also sex-based. Like, of course I have. But when you said intimacy, you're right. Because those nights she doesn't want to have sex. Instead of being like, well, I have to go to porn or to validate me. It's like, maybe we just do something awesome. Maybe we fucking you know, whatever, do something else romantic. That's not sex. And then by the way, maybe that makes her feel more valued. So then she wants to have sex more the next day. Like right. it all and so it makes her feel more connected or makes you like you build intimacy and then you feel closer and then, yeah. And then she wants to have sex. It's that's all, it. Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I, I should mention when I said it was harder, it's hard on days like today, but also I've been having these moments of pure fucking bliss and it's gonna sound like a lie not i've done dope stuff i played a huge sold out show in austin last night i just got back from hawaii 
not even that. I mean reading a book on the couch in silence before the sun comes up and being alone has been incredible. Today I went for like a walk because it was like 80 degrees in Austin. And I felt like I was on fucking mushrooms because I just put my phone on airplane mode because I'm like, I don't want to deal with this girl right now. And I just looked up at the sky and just started like looking at how big the sky was. And I started like giggling. Like it was literally like I was on drugs because you're so used to being on your phone and looking for all this stuff. So, you know, the amount that I can train, that I can do jujitsu, that my stand up is getting better, that, you know, my, my craft, all this stuff, all of that is because I'm alone. So yes, it's hard on days like today, but I'm also going to wake up tomorrow, like really fucking happy when before I thought the only way I could be happy is if I'm waking up to a girl and we're having sex and I get to, you know, post about me and her and just show the world like, look, I'm lovable. I mean, that's what it is. And the cancel, I had that before the cancellation. And now it's like, like, look, people can still love me. You know, I remember I had this it's insanely hot girlfriend after my cancellation. And we saw one of the celebrities who went after me in a whole foods parking lot. And I wanted to march right up to him and be like, one, I could kick your ass Two, This is my super hot girlfriend. Three. You almost made me kill myself. Fuck you. What that would have done. I have no idea. But like, did I feel like less cancelable when I have a hot girlfriend? Right. Yep. And by the way, mm -hmm. that shit I have to deal with on my own too, that I'm bringing into relationships, that fucking shame, that all of that, like I need to be able to know that I am a good man without a girlfriend, um, period. So that she doesn't become a fucking prop. Yeah. Well, this has been very inspiring. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate you opening up to me and to I, everyone that's watching. I hope they like. I have no idea how you're. I was wondering that. I was like, are her fans going to fucking hate me or is this going to be a good one? I don't know. I feel like you. I mean, I feel like the people who watch my channel, like I really actually genuinely appreciate most of the comments that I get on YouTube, which is funny because I, I got on YouTube pretty late, like much farther along when other people had been doing YouTube stuff forever. And I had sort of assumed that everybody on YouTube would hate me. Yeah. Um, I, uh, cause you always hear about like how awful it is, but it's like, it's not any, I mean, it's not any more awful than anywhere else on the internet, That's but right. in general, I feel like people make like fairly useful comments and aren't super hateful on my channel. Although of course there's always going to be random people who are going to be like, fuck this douchebag. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, read the comments, but I mean, yeah, yeah, like, I mean, who knows? We'll see. But Go I watch porn, you fucking cuck. Oh my God. One of my friends, who was it? It might be one of our mutuals. No, it was this guy, Dave Hunt. I think he's this like fitness guy where he's like, you guys are going to hate to hear this. He said this on his Instagram story, but he's like, if you watch porn all day, you're essentially just cuck holding yourself. And I'm like, hell yeah, dude. You're kind of, you're, you're just watching another, you're just watching another, another dude. Here. Fuck a girl. You can't fuck. Yeah, so like, if you, need, if you need some like alpha man shit instead of my like pussy, like, I'm just trying to better myself. Just do that. Don't be a, don't be a fucking cuck. There you go. And listen to my podcast, please. Yes. Okay. And so um, remind us, are you, it sounds like you're doing lots of comedy in Austin. Where can people go see you? Where can people yeah, find your, um, your stuff? I, I play at Vulcan a lot. Austin's so tricky because a lot of the stuff I post on Instagram, I'm just stopping by to do like a 10 minute set of like new stuff. But whenever there's like a big show, like I'm about to open for Duncan Trussell a couple of times, um, I post about that. But you can go to jamiekilstein.com slash tour. I'm opening for Adam Carolla a couple of times coming up. I'm well, opening for Dave Landau. I'm headlining in Arizona. Um, I just headlined Hawaii, but yeah, I'll, I'll hopefully have more comedy dates up. Um, I have a sub stack. Um, if you go to twitter.com slash Jamie Kilstein, um, I have a little link tree and my sub stacks there. And then the podcast, which I'm really proud of. You should come on that actually. Okay. Um, it's called advice not taken and it's a mental health comedy podcast. And it's, it's this conversation. It's me not coming from a place of like, I know more than you. It's me coming from a place of like, I am desperately trying to get better. Um, and then we're all kind of doing it together. So that's called advice not taken. And then um, if you guys want to do me a real solid, go follow me on Instagram because I'm shadow banned and you can go. I, mean, oh. I, I like Instagram. So I don't much think I even better. knew you were on Instagram. So that makes sense. There you go. At the Jamie Kilstein. Please go follow me. I even have a fucking blue check mark, but Instagram is my favorite. I make like comedy sketches and I talk about mental health, but I'm very yeah. shadow banned on there. 
Um, yeah, I okay, so I put your your Twitter in the show notes below this video, and I'll also edit it to add your the Instagram and your website and things like that so that people can find you more easily. You're the best. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, thank you guys very much. Don't forget to go follow Jamie on Instagram and Twitter and like, and subscribe and everyone have a wonderful night. Um, not watching pornography. Aloha. (laughs) Ha <laughs> ha.